I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Here we go! This is the Virtual Real Estate Investor Podcast with Vincent Polisi. Buckle your your seatbelt and prepare to learn how to legally make six figures investing in real estate with no money, no credit check, and nothing but a computer and internet connection. Learn how you too can begin generating buyers and sellers for free today and why you're only two calls away from making a $10,000 or more payday while never leaving the comfort of your home. And now, your host, the virtual real estate investor, Vincent Polisi. Here we go. All right, so for those of you who maybe didn't get the memo, who maybe haven't been following along in the Facebook group, who haven't maybe caught a lot, the last couple of um, podcast episodes or Facebook Lives or whatever, um, the focus of this particular phone call that you're about to listen to is one of my JVPs um, who has signed up for the initial pre-launch for a new platform that I'm coming out with because there's just overwhelming demand for it. And that platform is the Million Dollar Wholesaling Blueprint. And what the Million Dollar Wholesaling Blueprint is going to cover, it's going to be all-encompassing. It's unlike anything that's ever been put together before, certainly uh, as an individual course. But what it is, is an actual step-by-step -step blueprint to show you exactly what you need to do to create for yourself a vertically integrated real estate investing company, whether your focus is wholesaling, which is really what the gist of this particular platform is on. And the reason for that is, is because I've never, number one, done a wholesaling actual course before for a lot of different reasons, which get explained um, in, in this conversation that you're about to hear, but also because there's just unbelievable demand for it by people like you listening to this course. And you need to have the right information and information that is going to help you create a business, number one, that's sustainable, that generates income in perpetuity, that generates multiple streams of income, that puts you in the best possible position to create for yourself a platform by which you can outshine, outperform all of your quote-unquote local competition because what they are doing is they're following all along with all these other nonsense courses that are out there. They're not acting like true professionals. And it's basically a, a little paper shuffle, right? It's just like, you know, one little, uh, what I call the ham and eggers, one little deal at a time. And there's really no thought process given to building an actual business okay, that has sustainability, that where you build out pipelines, where you've got the opportunity to not solely focus on trying to, to force the, you know, the square peg into the round hole, meaning every deal has to be a wholesale deal. Otherwise it's not a deal and you don't have a deal, uh, an opportunity to make money. That's just an absolute, just an idiotic model, but unfortunately that's what gets taught out there. So for those of you who don't know what vertical integration is, basically what vertical integration means is that I'll give you an example. Um, back in, I don't know, it was it early 2001, I believe I went to, I was in mortgage banking at the time in Atlanta and I went to work for the largest um, private home builder in Atlanta, a guy by the name of John Wheland. Um, he's doing about a half a billion dollars in new construction sales annually at that point. He'd been in business for about 30 years and I was on the mortgage banking side. Well, John was very smart, very, very sharp guy. Obviously, you, you know, you kind of have to be to be able to make that kind of money and to have those, that type of sales volume. But what he did, he figured out very early on that he could maximize his profit by being his own supplier of everything. And so a vertically integrated company means, well, his product is new construction houses, right? That's how he makes the money. That's where the money comes from. But what he did to maximize profit was he had every possible component taken care of with its own individual company under his umbrella. So in other words, he had his own lumber company. Okay, so now he cut out the middleman. He didn't have to go to Home Depot. Had his own lumber company. Had his own um, landscaping company. Okay, so now he cut out the, the, that middleman there. Didn't have to go to whoever. I don't know where people go buy sod and all that. But nonetheless, had all that taken care of. Had his own pest control company. Okay, had his own mortgage company. Had his own. Um, I'm trying, he actually had a had a really high end, um, you know, rehab and remodel company. Um, you know, for multi million dollar homes. He he basically had every everything in the entire process from acquisition to a sale 
covered internally under the corporate umbrella. And it's a genius way to do business. It's called vertical integration. It means you can handle everything, but it also helps you maximize profit. It also helps you minimize expense. It also gives you greater control. And it also helps you in doing deals that otherwise you would not have been able to do. Because as an example, in his case, I didn't know any other home builders, new construction builders, especially guys that high-end stuff, that also had their own rehab companies. Yeah, you just you just don't typically see that. You don't like, you know, Pulte is not known for, if they have one, I'm not aware of it, but, if, you know, uh, uh, Toll Brothers, I don't know that they have their own rehab companies either. But he did. He had his own mortgage company. He had, yeah, everything was just all set and tied together. So this call is with the JVP. He had some questions. Um, you guys are going to get to hear how all of this stuff gets tied together. This thing is jam-packed, chock full of just unbelievable value. So trust me, it's worth the listen. And here you go. Good afternoon, Ms. Vincent. Hey, Vincent. How's it? What's up, my man? Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Good. 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 Hey, so, all right. So, um, did, did you put did you put together a list of questions? Uh, yep. I sent them right over in um, Slack. I got them right here. Okay. Hang on a Okay, questions so far are how lockdown deals when talking to sellers. Well, that's very simple. And the answer is going to be covered in its entirety as we go through things. Because here's basically, if you understand the, the, the basic quote-unquote wholesaling course that's out there right now, it's very, um, how do I say it, very simplistic, linear, and, and, and not very granular to the point of explaining what to do when somebody says, no, I don't want to sell it, you know, 60% of fair market value, right? Obviously. Okay. And so <clears throat> the purpose of what I'm putting together through the, the, you know, the combination of what's called vertical integration is to show you how to handle that through the alternative choice close, which is going to require, um, you know, and you need to understand that before we get into this, let's have this conversation up front. <clears throat> you do not need to be thinking about this as a course, okay? You need to be thinking about it as the actual blueprint, okay? The step-by-step -step blueprint for your business, okay? And your, your objective, your function is going to be to step-by-step -step check off all the boxes of all the things that have to get done continuously in the pursuit of complete vertical integration, which will then enable you to profit multiple ways that other people can't because the only thing that they're thinking about is you, you know what the Mayo formula is, right? Mm, yeah. You know, you know, talking about Mayo formula. Okay. So all they're thinking about is the Mayo formula and then adding on my assignment fee. And you know, that's, that's the only way to, to do a deal and make money. And that's wrong. That's not what professionals do. So as far as how to lock down deals and talking to sellers, you're going to basically give them the alternative choice clause. You do, you know, one of three things, or well, actually one of four things, depending on how you want to do it. It's one, hey, listen, Mr. Seller, if you want cash, I can pay cash and close in, you know, uh, say 10 days from the time we have clear title, right? Mm -hmm. And the, pr the price for that is going to be whatever you come up with, 60%, 65%, 70%. And that's going to be predicated off of your buyer's criteria because you're going to have pre-qualified buyers up front. You're not going to go out there. So what these, these idiotic courses teach people to do, it's all backwards, Right. Then once you go out there and contract on a property that you don't know that you can sell and move, you don't even know if it's a deal. And that's why you see these people all over Facebook all the time. What are they doing? Oh, I got this thing. I can't get rid of it. You know, blah, blah, blah. I've only got X number of days left on the contract. Right. And they have no idea. You know, they don't, they don't know what a deal is. They just are going through the motions because they bought somebody's, you know, shit course. And it, it is it didn't really explain to them how to do things correctly. So instead of doing things backwards, we're going to do things the correct way, which is we're going buyer first. So we're going to pre-qualify all the buyers. That way you know what a deal is and you already know that you've got it sold because you already know the buyer's criteria and all that's going to be in Podio. Okay. Because what I'm going to personally start doing, which nobody's ever done to my knowledge, if they have, I'm not aware of it, uh, is I'm going to start creating a master buyers list for all of the United States. Okay. I'm, I'm setting that as part of my, my daily ritual to, contact actual buyers, myself personally, and then walk them through the pre-qualification process 
and input all that data into Podio so that then you guys will be able to very quickly filter through, siphon through to determine who is a buyer for whatever it is, whatever target that you're going after, or to put it the right way, to give you the target to go after. Okay, so when some guy, his criteria for what he's going to buy is going to be, could be completely different than somebody else's, but you'll know that you'll be able to filter through all of the different variables so that you understand what a deal is. When something comes across your desk or the, you get a lead on wherever you're getting your leads from, a phone call, or, you know, from a postcard or whatever, you'll, you'll already know, okay, I've got this thing done. Yes, it's, it's worth my time moving forward, okay, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. And so basically it's the alternative choice close. So alternative choice close number one is going to be, I can pay cash and close 10 days from clear title. And my price is, you know, so, you know, whatever, 65% of after repair value. Okay. 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 And, and they balk on that because like, they don't want to take that kind of haircut, which I get. So option number two is assuming it doesn't need a whole lot of work or any work really preferably would be that you can pay 100% if, you know, you, you, you can pay their price as long as you get your terms, and your terms would be owner finance terms, okay? And in that situation, so now you, you, now you haven't lost the opportunity to make money because I don't – look, I don't care what the deal structure is. I just want to make money, okay? And that's the way you should be right. too. You don't need to try to force it into some wholesale deal so or contract assignment deal or whatever. So I can pay – listen, I can pay your price as long as I can get my terms, well, what are your terms? Well, my terms are I'll pay full price. I can pay you what you, you know, the actual value of the property, but I need owner finance terms, you know, and, you know, based on XYZ and a 24 month balloon or blah, 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 whatever, however you end up doing it. Right. And that's option two. Okay. So we're talking about the alternative choice close. Okay. Um, alternative choice number three is, okay, if you don't like either one of those, then, and if, if the property needs work, then we can joint venture on the deal because obviously the property needs work. They don't have the cash put into it. It's going to take, you know, capital to be able to, to get the property to that point. Then we can joint venture on the deal. You provide the property. I'll provide the cash through hard money loans or private financing or whatever. And then we split the profits. Okay. So that's another alternative that you can do with somebody to help them, you know, to, to fix their situation, help them move the property. A lot, of, a lot of times they're not going to sell the property unless they either take a ma major haircut or they, they get it into turnkey condition. Okay. And then option number four would be once you have your license that, okay, if you don't like any of those, then I can list the property for you. Right. And get an MLS and, and see, if we can get the property sold that way, which I'm not a fan of real estate licenses. I've had one, I had a mortgage, mortgage broker's license, all that stuff. But for this type of strategy, okay. If you're talking about being in this for the long haul, it really, I, I have to, I have to almost backtrack on everything I've, I've ever said regarding licensing because it's, it only, it makes sense. Okay. I mean, it's just, it's just another thing where, you know, you're going to spend whatever the hell it is. I don't know. Was it 40 hours or six weeks or whatever and 350 bucks, take your test, get the license. The downside, I've, I've got a whole podcast on the downsides of getting a license. And of course that's all the, um, all the, you know, excessive disclosure requirements and the additional liability that you have because, in the eyes of the law, um, you're perceived to have greater knowledge than a non-licensed individual, okay? Which most realtors, that's really, that's really not the case because most of them are idiots. But nonetheless, that's when you get into court, that's they're going to perceive you to have, you know, a greater uh, advantage, shall we say, over and above um, whoever you're dealing with. And so that, that works against you in court, if that makes any sense. So you, you have to understand that you guys just got to, you got to make sure you have all your eyes dotted and T's crossed. So there's four different methods right there on different ways to get a deal done that the average investor that's out there is not doing when they're working, you know, wholesale leads. Okay. So right now, all of a sudden you, you just got a whole arsenal, a bunch of weapons in your arsenal that will help you counter the objection of, um, you know, I don't want to sell 65%. Well, and, and a question that I would normally ask is, okay, listen, you know, obviously I, yeah, I get that. Trust me, I do. But based on the condition of the property with where you're at today, 
um, you know, it needs a lot of work. It's this, it's that, it's that. It's going to take it this much money to, to fix it. Somebody's going to have to come in, blah, 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 blah. You know, what do you, what, what, if in the event that you can't sell it for what you're looking for, what's plan B, right? And I do this all the time on when we're doing owner finance stuff because you have to understand psychology. They don't have plan B, okay? When somebody lists a property, their only thought process is I'm going to sell the house conventionally, okay? And so what you have to do, you need to understand this, is that you have to be, you have to plant that seed that, okay, in the event that it doesn't sell the way you want it to, what's plan B? Well, they haven't thought of this yet. So you got to get those synapses to fire, okay, to make them think through that process so it can open up the door for, you know, preferably your preferred method of acquiring the property and then exiting the property. Um, or if not, one of the other three or four alternatives that are there where you can still make money so you haven't wasted time because you've spent money on marketing to get in front of that person, whether it's on the phone or face-to-face or whatever. And obviously the objective there is to make money, okay? So mm-hmm. that's it. And you, you have to plant that seed. You got to say, okay, well, if, if that doesn't happen, then what? What are you going to do? And then shut yeah, up. He's, he's, he said um, if they don't sell for their price, you didn't ask them what's plan B. Yeah. So, no, let me, if you listen to some of the podcasts or some of the calls I do, you can hear exactly how I do it. I said, okay, well, Mr. Seller, you know, I can appreciate that. And, and let me just say this. If you can sell a property today for cash, right, as an investor, that's what I would do, okay? That's, that's the advice that I would give you also. That's the very best scenario for you. But if that doesn't materialize, what's plan B? And then shut up. It's called the, it's called the silent close, right? And, and just be quiet and let them, let them tell you what plan B is. Okay? Sometimes I don't have plan B. Yeah. And, 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 I the, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I, I listen to the podcast. I know you do the seven-step sales process. Mm-hmm. But it's funny because, like, you do it so smooth, it's kind of hard to realize, like, what step that you are on during the process. It's kind of hard to, like, keep up and, like, break it down. Yeah. Well, because it's, it's all – you need to understand something. This is a big thing with people. I'm, I'm a professional sales closer, okay? And I, it's all done in a consultative and conversational style. So it comes off as natural, not reading a script or trying to follow – a protocol and the seven step sales process, the way I break it down, I do all of those things in every call. Sometimes the order changes a little bit depending on how the call you have to be, you have to be flexible. You have to understand every conversation is different. They're not all going to follow the exact same path. Sometimes the building rapport aspect isn't upfront where it really ideally should be. Sometimes it comes on later in the conversation. I'm looking for it's, you know, and you need to understand building rapport on the phone is much more difficult than building rapport in person because in person you can see them, you can see what they're wearing. Okay, are they wearing a Florida Gator football hat? Okay, now we got some common thread. I can we can talk about. Are they, you know, whatever they they drive up? They they have uh, a license plate from, you know, Georgia. I used to live there. Okay, so there's something that you can communicate and talk to them about other than the weather, if that makes sense. And on the phone, you don't have the same. Plus, you don't have you don't have eye contact. You don't have you can't read body language. You can't do any of those things. So it can become very challenging to build rapport on the phone. So you have to look for those opportunities when they happen. It doesn't always happen in that exact sequence. Okay, the one thing that always does happen up front, because I don't waste time, is a prequalification. That always has to happen first. Okay, I don't have because I don't have time. And I don't, and I'm telling you, you're you're a young guy. You're trying to make a name for yourself. You're trying to get your business going. You cannot entertain these people because you're quote unquote afraid to lose a deal. You got to drop the camera up front, right out of the gate. You're a businessman. You're a professional. You're going to run your business the right way, and you cannot help them. You cannot answer any questions unless you know what you're dealing with. And a very easy way to to do that is, hey, you know, because um, I'm always going to ask you, tell me about your program. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. Blah blah blah. What's the price? Listen, I'll be happy to you know, get you all that information. But first, let me get, ask you a couple questions so I can custom tailor uh, everything for you personally. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. At, at, so and everybody. I'm, I'm sorry. I was going to say, so that's Go what on. happens with the, on the owner finance side too. A lot of times they'll try to pre, uh, pre-call for the buyers, you know, go through the eight questions that you told us. But mm-hmm. a lot of times they get defensive and it's like, I'll ask, all right, so, um, you know, what's, what are you able to do as far as the down payment? And they're like, well, you tell me what the down payment is. Okay. 
Well, guess what? Welcome to real estate and welcome to sales, buddy. You got to be able to, to deal with objection handling. That's a very easy. Let me explain to you why they ask you that question. And I'll explain to you why you struggle with it. If you if you are in fact struggling with it. Okay. Which you shouldn't be because I don't struggle with it. And you don't have to struggle with it either. All right. If you ask the questions exactly the way I have them laid out on Podio, you're, I, I don't, I don't have that problem. Okay. Because what I ask them is, you know, hey, you know, we're, you know, it's it's very, you know, step by step. Um, what kind of payment are you looking for? When are you looking to move? Would you have set aside for a down payment, right? Blah blah blah. And then when we go through there, and if they if they get all, you know, wanting to hold their cards close to the vest deal, then that's fine. They ask you, well, you know, what do you require for down payment? The reason they're asking you that is because the vulture investors that are out there. We'll ask them, what do you have set aside for a down payment? And they say 50 grand. And okay, what's the down payment requirement? Well, guess what? It just happens to be 50 grand because that's how much you have, right? And it's it's bullshit. And everybody knows it's bullshit. So that's why they're trying to find out up front. Um, And that's why I have it laid out on the website. Like, like, I'm not here to play games. the, The down payment requirement, we parallel current Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac guidelines based on the loan to value ratio that you're going to need to refinance into your own name, plus we charge an additional one and a half points in closing costs because you're going to have to have that equity position when it comes time to, re- comes time to do the refinance so you don't have to have any more cash out of pocket. Okay, that's a legitimate answer. And I didn't evade any, I didn't evade anything. And I told them up front, and oh, by the way, I use the, it's, it's the because connector, which is a psychological connector in sales. So you can tell somebody, something well okay what's what about this and you give an answer but if there's no validation no reason for it it's worthless okay now all you're doing is shooting yourself on the foot so our you know our down payments parallel current Fannie Mae Freddie Mac guidelines based on you don't have to memorize this or whatever I'm just telling this what I say based on the loan to value ratio of the loan that you're going to have to get when you go go to refinance because Okay, so here's why it's that way. Here's what it is, and here's why. Does that make sense? Because you're going to have to have that equity position in place in order to refinance and not have to come out of pocket with more cash down the road. Okay? Pretty simple. Uh, okay. This is, this is just basic objection handling. Okay? Okay. Very, very basic objection handling. I'll start, I'll start opening that stuff up. I see, the, see, here's the problem. This people get, get like all funky about, oh, how come you have everything locked down? Well, I have everything locked down because what people try to do, especially analyticals, and you're an analytical, most people that are attracted to real estate are analyticals. Um, what they, they want to do is they want to drink through a fire hose and get all this information, blah, 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 blah. And then they go out there and most of the time, actually, they don't even go out there and take action because they're they're too enamored with uh, minutia and data and all this kind of stuff. And the way I have things set up, what I, I want you doing three things and three things only at, right out of the gate. That's prospecting, pre-qualifying, requesting a call with me. That's it. Because that's your fastest path to getting paid. Understanding how to handle every single objection, understanding all the different deal structures, understanding all the contract law, while absolutely necessary and beneficial, is not what you need to be focusing on day one when you're working through trying to get a deal done. That's what you have me for as a joint venture partner. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Now, as you progress and go along and you get a deal done, then it's time to start, you know, feeding you a little bit more of, um, you know, the super serum that you're going to need to be able to handle these things on your own. But initially out of the gate, I try to keep it very, you know, it's the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid, right? Mm-hmm. Prospect, pre-qualify, request call. That's all I want you to do. I don't want you trying, going out there handling objections out of the gate because you're not qualified yet to do that. And as wonderful as the job as I can do is putting the information out there, you're going to stumble and, 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 and falter initially like everybody, like I did myself personally, until you've done it enough times, okay? And right now, when people come in to pay for a course, the reason they're paying for a course is because they want to make money. And they want to make money quickly. So I have it set up to try to make help everybody make money quickly. But then everybody wants to fight and argue with me about, well, you need to release all this other information. Why? You're not supposed to be doing any of that if you want to make money. Right now, all you're supposed to be doing is this so we can get you paid. 
but then they don't like that. So what I've decided to do is just go ahead and open everything up and everybody can go shoot themselves in the foot and waste much time and not make any money because that's what they're doing anyway because they're not taking action most of the time anyway. So whatever, that's a whole different topic. All right, next question. How do you how to pitch and structure owner finance deals? It's very simple. That's that's very simple. Number one, I go buyer first. The reason I go buyer first is because I can I can contract on one house and get paid. If I go inventory first, which is what they teach in all these stupid wholesaling courses and lease option courses and all this other crap, then you can contract on 10 properties and sell none of them and make no money. And then you have a logistical nightmare on your hands because you're dealing with all these sellers that want updates. Why are my property sold? You told me this. You told me that. Now they're pissed off. Right? I don't have time for that. I did that back in 2008. Okay, I contracted on over 40, literally over $40 million worth of property in less than eight weeks. And it was a f***ing nightmare, man. Okay. It was great. I had all this inventory on the website, marketing all these properties. But then what you find out is two things. What you'll find out is two things. Nine times out of 10, somebody calling you on that property, they don't want the house. Okay. What they trigger off is they, they trigger off with no credit qualifying. I had a matter of fact, we had a voicemail yesterday from somebody in Atlanta on a deal. And you could, I could just, I listened to the voicemail. I already knew exactly where it was going. She didn't want the house. She triggered off that it's no credit qualifying. Okay, what do I have to do to get into this house or, or another house is what she was asking, okay, which yeah. lets me know up front. She doesn't want the house. They trigger off the no credit qualifying and owner finance aspects, okay, because they've got some kind of credit issue or they have, you know, some kind of qualification issue or whatever. So I go buyer first, right, and it's I ask the nine questions, nine pre questions. I don't waste time. I don't entertain people. I don't explain a damn thing until I have all of the pre-call questions answered. I'm not doing it because what they're going to do, especially with a guy like you, you're a nice guy. Okay. And the problem with being a nice guy is you heard the expression and it's true. Nice guys finish last. And what they'll do is they will waste all of your time allowing you to entertain them on the phone only to find out they don't have any money. Okay. They can't do a deal. They're in a lease for nine more months, blah, blah, blah. All the 27 different excuses they're going to give you. But they let you entertain them for 45 minutes on the phone explaining every nuance of owner finance contracts and deal structures and everything else. We don't have time for that. Okay. And uh, it happened to me. I, I allowed it to happen to myself twice. Once was 45 minutes. Once was an hour and a half. And I said, you know what? I am never doing that stupid shit again. And I got, I don't have that kind of time. I got kids to feed. I got stuff I want to do. I don't have time to sit here and waste time with people that are not capable <coughs> of consummating a deal. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> and you don't either. Right? Time is money. You need to be focused on making money. Okay. When to use a mem- – excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. When to, use a, when to use a memorandum? Well, there's lots of different ways and reasons to use a memorandum. Basically, if you're talking about wholesaling, the, the big concern that a lot of people have is circumvention. Right. So right. the seller, si- seller signs a contract with you at hundred grand, whatever it is, go to these beater houses, these people go after. Um, mm-hmm. And then you're worried about, okay, he's being bombarded by 27 other wholesalers and somebody else comes in and offers him 120 grand. And so he takes that contract and he moves forward to try to close on that. He does it ahead of your closing date. And then you, you're set to close also, but you can't close because he's already sold the property and, you know, basically tells you tough shit. Right. Okay. So I'm talking about, understand something. I'm talking about legitimate business here, not this BS they teach in these courses. If you do it my way, my way, right. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be contracting on a house unless you know, you've already got it sold. Okay. We go buyer first. What's the buyer want? Does this meet what the buyer match, what the buyer wants? Okay. The guy that's going to pay the cash or the assignment fee or however you're going to do the deal. Right. So you're going to know up front, yes, I are this, you know, the, the odds are that I've already got this property sold. So I'm going to contract on the property. The minute you contra- contract on the property, guess what should happen? The minute the ink is executed, the minute the ink is on that paper, guess what should happen? Two things. Two things immediately right out of the gate. One is you should pull title. Okay. That should be number one because they're, they're going to, you know, these guys are going to want to, you know, to know they got clear title. And if you do a double close, you're going to have to have clear title anyway. And number two is you go record the memorandum. Okay. And you don't even have to go anywhere to do it. I have mobile notaries handle it. It costs typically about 75 bucks. It's not a big deal. We go, oh, well, I want to spend 75 bucks. Well, then why the f are you doing a deal? Okay. Why are you wasting time? Okay. If you're not serious, what are you doing? Right. It's, it's, it's a cost of doing business. So what happens is, 
um, you know, have the um, mobile notary come. I, I execute the, or I sometimes actually, um, let me, I'll tell you how, how it typically works because most of my stuff is, is actually all of it's 100% virtual. So last memorandum I had to file, I went down to, I always have a UPS, UPS store box, depending on what location we're at in the United States because we travel all the time. I go down to UPS store, I, I take the memorandum, I execute it, they notarize it, and then I have to FedEx it to, or UP, overnight UPS it to the mobile notary. Okay, mobile notary gets it, and then he, she, in this case, she t t takes it down to the courthouse and gets it recorded. Okay, and then I just send them a payment for PayPal. They send me an invoice not paying via PayPal. Okay, and guess what happens? Ain't nobody closing without your release. Let me rephrase that. Nobody's closing legally without your release. I have heard, I haven't seen it happen yet, but I've heard that there's some attorneys that are out there that will close over the memorandum, even though it's cloud on title. You can't, I mean, there's only so much you can do to deal with, you know, unscrupulous people, especially attorneys. So I understand it for what it is, but in the last one that I did, guess what? The guy, cause the guy screwed me and, oh, he goes, he, he does, goes through and does all the rehab. And, um, you know, he thinks he's, he's smart. And he goes to close with the buyer, right? And they pull title and guess who pops up? <laughs> Me. You. Hey, here I am with my hand out. Okay. You understand? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and no, you can't close. And I got all the, you know, begging and pleading and blah, 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 blah. And all the other stuff. So the crap. And uh, the answer is no. Right. You know, I got the whole sob story, but I'm not making that much money. Oh, yeah. I don't care. Right. <laughs> what does that got to do with me? I had to clear IRS liens. I had to clear IRS liens and all kinds of crap on that thing. And so that's that's what your protection is. I'm talking about legitimately, okay? It, when your intent, your actual intent is to close, okay? Not this bullshit they teach you in these courses, okay? When you when you contract on a property for a wholesale deal, if it's whether you're doing a double closing or an assignment contract assignment, which is not a wholesale deal, but you already know that from listening to the podcast. The, um, right. Okay. Regardless of what your exit strategy is going to be, the objective should be the only thought process is I'm closing and getting paid. Okay. And if that's the case, then you pull title immediately. You're like, oh, well, I don't want to spend money on title in case it doesn't close. Well, you know what? Suck it up, Buttercup. You got to put your big boy pants on. And I explained in the podcast, I tell people what I always did in mortgage banking because we had to order title on every every application that came through that we thought we were going to close which obviously we didn't close all of them. Just like you're not going to unfortunately close every real estate deal. You're going to do everything you can to do that. But what I did was I picked a title company or a real estate attorney. And I said, hey, look, here's the deal. I'm going to send you 100% of my business. I'm not going anyplace else. And, uh, you know, obviously some of these things are not going to close. I don't want to pay for titles on deals that do not close. So what I want you to do is I want you to upcharge your title fees to me per deal on a per deal basis to cover and account for, you know, the $175 or whatever it is you paid for the abstract. So I don't have to pay it. Does that make sense? So instead of them charging, I don't know, whatever the hell it was, say, you know, three or 400 bucks or $300 or whatever, they would charge me say like 375 a deal. Does that make sense? Yeah. Which is all paid for. It's all paid for by the buyer. So I mean, it's just it's just it's a closing cost. It's on there by the buyer. But in doing it that way, okay. So I, I didn't pay three hundred. I paid three. I say I, you know, the closing cost wasn't three hundred. So let's say it was three seventy five. But I never had to pay for title work that on, on a deal that didn't close. Okay. So you you can do these things because all these people are all worried about. Well, no, I got to pay seventy five dollars for a mobile notary plus recording fees or whatever it is to get recorded for the memorandum, and then I got to pay you know, whatever this 175 bucks for the abstract for them to pull the title. And if it doesn't close now, I'm out 250. Is that right? You know, 250. Um, and guess what? It's a business, man. That's the way it works. Cost of doing business, right? And if you don't want to pay the, the title abstract fee, which I don't want to pay it either, then you go and you negotiate that deal. It's a real simple question. Hey, Mr. Attorney, I'm going to send you this, uh, this volume of deals I do. I'm going to send you every deal I got. I'm not going to go anyplace else. You're going to get all the loyalty, everything else. But I don't want to pay for the title fees on deals that don't close. What I want you to do is upcharge each individual deal, charge me more to compensate and offset for any that don't close. Period. That's it. Done. Okay. And so basically it gets amortized into your deal. You understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? 
I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, you're still paying, you're still paying it, okay? But you're paying it out of, um, you know, future profits. Right. I mean, does that make sense? Do, do, okay. are, are, are you following, following what I'm saying? So yeah. I don't have to, I don't have to pay it unless I'm getting paid. Right. Okay. And I'm okay paying it if I'm getting paid. I'm okay. Okay. So it costs me an extra seventy-five bucks, or hundred bucks, or hundred and fifty bucks out of my ten grand that I just made. Fantastic, but I didn't have to pay for the three that didn't close. That would have been another four fifty. Okay, so I mean, like, you understand what I mean? It's like it's not this stuff is not rocket science. But they they don't teach you stuff how to do stuff the right way. All right, how to clear a title before talking to a buyer and then get paid at time of assignment. How to clear title before talking to a buyer and then get paid at time of assignment. Okay, I mean that's real simple. That's why I just got done telling you. As soon as you contract on a property. And you, you need to understand this. You, you can't be one of these, you know, slick willies, okay? One of these little, little weasel guys that, that are out there, the typical wholesaler that is going to try to lock a property up and then, oh, I'm not going to put money down at the title company, which I don't advise doing anyway, but nonetheless, that's the traditional method. Um, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to have weasel, weasel clauses built in so I can get it, you know, I can, you know, um, weasel out of the deal and all that kind of crap. That's, if you're going in it with that mentality, that's wrong. Don't do it, Okay. Honesty is the best policy, transparency of exactly what you're doing, no problems. And if you're contracting on something, it should be only from the standpoint of one of two things. It's either A, I know I've already got it sold because I'm going buyer first and it matches buyer's criteria, or backup position. What if it doesn't go that way? Well, then guess what's going to happen? As part of this deal, you'll be able to have resources for private money and hard money to then put you in a position of not having to bail out on a deal where you can then handle, you can do the double close and you and hand, actually it's not a double close, you do a single close and then handle the rehab, <coughs> excuse me, and then sell it retail. Okay. Okay. With no money, with no money out of your pocket. That's, that's the whole point. All right. So my point there is that any deal that you contract on should be in your mind. The only thing that you're doing with that deal is closing. Okay. Does that make sense? Not like, how can I get out of this deal? It's, this is a deal. I know it's a deal because it meets the buyer's criteria. Okay. For whatever reason, that buyer doesn't want it because of God only knows what. It's still a deal based on the numbers because you've done your homework. And then I'm going to get private money to close, do the rehab myself, and I'll take 100% of the profit with no cash out of my own pocket. Okay. Because you you allow the asset, the collateral, the house to be the justification and basis for the hard money or private money note, and not you personally. So it's non-recourse, if you understand what that means. In other words, I'm not putting any money down because I've got, I'm contracting on a property with 40% equity. So even if I default on you, Mr. Private Money Lender, you're getting a property with 40% equity. Right. You understand okay. what I'm saying? Just, uh, you, you understand what I'm saying? So you don't need money from me. You, you, it's the, the collateral, the asset. That's that's where you know your protection is. You don't need additional skin in the game from me for what? That's not how I work this deal. You don't get 40% equity and m- money from me. The answer to that's no. Okay. okay. What you're get, what you're, you're going to get is you're going to get 12% interest and in, in three points. Okay, for the period of time for doing that deal. Plus, you're in the event of a problem, you've got 40% equity in the deal plus any capital improvements I've done up until that point in time. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. That's, that's smart. Uh, yeah. Well, it's just, uh, of course, of course it, it just, it makes sense. It's a good deal, right? And it's a good deal for you. And it's a good deal for them. But you know, a lot of these guys are trained that they want, they want to, um, this is where, where guys like you can never seem to get ahead because you're told that you got to have, you know, cash to put into a deal. You never put your own cash in a deal. I never have it, and, and I don't have any intention of. Okay, you always leverage other people's money. Okay, pay the pay the juice. It's worth it because you have no risk financially. You stay liquid, and if it's structured properly, it's non recourse, so you don't have a problem with them coming after you personally. Mm-hmm. You, understand, you understand what non recourse means? It means that you, yeah. you, there's no personal there's no personal guarantee they can't come after you for a damn thing. They have to. The asset is the collateral. Or the collateral is the asset. It's the it's what they go after. And that's how they how they become whole in the event that thing goes sideways. Okay. So to answer the question, the question should be 
ink is on the contract, next two things that happen immediately are title gets ordered right out of the gate, which you don't pay for up front anyway, by the way. And two, um, maybe set up the way I, I told you, you'll never pay for it anyway, unless you're actually getting paid. And number two, file a memorandum. Okay, and that way you protected your position and you're moving forward to get the title clear. Now, once the title's clear, which, okay, on the standard deal, even though it's not your responsibility to provide a clear title because that's been that's the seller's responsibility they've agreed to in the purchase and sale agreement, nonetheless, all these guys are trained out there to make you guys be title jockeys. And I, and I get it. They don't want to pay you ten grand on an assignment fee, not understanding if they can close. Once the title's clear and you have your contract, and you have your memorandum filed, and you have your assignment ready to go, and you have a, a, a professional package put together for a buyer, and this is what most people don't want to do, okay, they want to do this sort of half-ass bullshit, you, I mean, you got to understand, you got to be a professional, man, if you want to make money, and you want to turn this into a consistent business, and have a pipeline, and not have problems, you got to put the work in, and that's what most of these people don't want to do, they don't want to put a prospectus together, okay, for a buyer. They just like, here's the address, here's the price, here's the assignment fee, blah, 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 blah. That's it. And it's a big monumental waste of time. You want to be at the top. Like when you submit a deal to a buyer, it should, you have to understand, it should be, there, there should be a prospectus. Okay. And if you don't know what a prospectus is, basically it's a, it's an overview of the actual deal and it should answer every single possible potential question that they should have. They should not have to ask you any questions about the deal whatsoever. It should all be answered in there. People don't do this though. Okay. Right. You see so the you, like you a see, professional like a pre professional presentation of the property. The exactly. Well and the deal, yeah. And the deal. Like okay, because what are they what are they concerned about? What's it gonna cost me? Right? What's what's my exit strategy? How much am I gonna make potentially in profit? What are the what are the bugaboos, right? The it's called like a SWOT analysis. Strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats called SWOT. SWOT, sweet strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Okay. Well, all these things, all these things have to be answered. Okay. Up front. And if, well, if you can do that and you put your stuff together and it doesn't take me like it, it, you should have, you know, 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour max to put all that information together. Once you have it in a template form, which I'll provide. Okay. Then all you do is plug in your information and bam, you generate out a beautiful report that you can put on a website, that you can send to somebody in a PDF, whatever it is, because you want your deals going to the top. And the way that your deals are going to go to the top of their stack of potential deals is by doing your homework and providing them the information that they need to conclude whether or not it's a deal without having to pull teeth or go back and forth 27 times. And, you know, you see the stupid shit they put on Facebook, dude. I mean, the, the crap that people put out there, it, it's ridiculous. Okay, it's not it's not professional. It's I mean it's just like you know they they vomit up a couple of details and then like oh PM me or oh, inbox me or blah 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 yeah, exactly. you know all, all this crap and it's like why, why should I have to do that to get the I mean if it's a deal and you have it under contract right and you're doing things the right way you're not worried about circumvention just put all the crap out there what's the problem yeah. but they don't do it that way because they're fucking lazy okay and you can't be lazy if you want to make money dude. Right, I'm just telling you, you can't be lazy. You can listen, Isaiah, let me explain this to you. You can be stupid. You can be not as intelligent as the next guy, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can you cannot have the, the skills that the next guy has. You're not, you cannot have the closing ability of that guy. But the one thing that you can do, even if you have all those things going against you, guess what you can do? You can outwork that mother okay? That's what you can do. And you can do things the right way, Okay. You understand what I'm saying? That will, that will get you the results that you're looking for. And if you watch, look at Facebook, dude. I mean, like, come on. What are, what are they doing? It's it's just like a, you know, it's 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 ridiculous. It's like Wampa Room. You're dealing, dealing with a bunch of, you know, three-year-olds all jacked up on Pixie Six and Mountain Dew. They don't know what the hell they're doing, you know? Right. And, they just, and, and it's just, it's like a, it's a, it's like a three-ring circus. So, anyway. All right. So, contract on property, memorandum. Order title immediately. Title comes back. Now you know what you got to deal with to clear the title. Um, and depending on, you know, every, obviously every title is different. You don't know what's going to be on there uh, until you actually get it back. But then at that point in time, once you've got the title back, again, remember who your partner in the deal is. Your partner in the deal is the seller because it's his responsibility to, to clear title, not yours. So 
So he gets re, he gets reengaged to help you get what you need to clear the title. Now that you've got clear title, you have all your contracts out, you've got your prospectus together, bam, here you go, Mr. Buyer. Here's the whole thing laid out. We got clear title. We got here's all the contracts. Here's the, the um, assignment agreement. You know, here's the prospectus. Here's all the, all the numbers. Blah 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 blah. You want you, you want this deal? Yes or no? Yes. Fantastic. I'm gonna uh, um, execute the assignment agreement, and the assignment agreement is going to indicate that uh, the assignment fee is due at the time of the assignment. And the they want you to wait for some future closing. The answer is uh, I don't understand why, because we have clear title. Okay. Mm-hmm. The only thing in the way now of this thing closing is you, Mr. Buyer, not me, not the deal. You're not worried about something right. popping up, popping up before closing because they're not going to pull title again. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They don't pull. They don't pull. They don't pull title twice. In other words, they're not going to pull title again. You got clear title. Bam, let's go. So, in, in the real world of contract assignments, okay, the real world. I'm talking about the real professional world. They're all paid at the time of the assignment because you're assigning all right title and interest in the property at that point in time. And so, what you're doing here is you're taking. You're painting the buyer into a corner, and you're taking away all of his excuses as to why not to pay you right then. And the only legitimate reason that he would have for not being able to pay the assignment fee right then would be he's obtaining financing for the acquisition, so he doesn't have the cash. Does that make sense? Right. But I'm not even sure that's a listen. I'm not even sure that's a legitimate excuse because in Hard money lending, and there, you know, most of the hard money lenders are going to require that they have an X amount of cash down. Okay, mm-hmm. so they would have to have some degree of liquidity in order to be able to move forward with a hard money loan, okay, or private money. So it really shouldn't be an issue if it's handled properly. And if they balk and say, "Listen, if I have to," my, this is my answer. Let's look, Mr. Buyer. Okay, we've got. Solid contract. We've got clear title. Here's all the numbers. They all, everything makes sense. Here's all your estimate of repairs. Here's all these things. We're ready to do the assignment, but on an assignment, I get paid at the time of the assignment. There's nothing standing in the way of you closing other than you and whatever your deal is. And I'm not, I don't, it's not for me to have to wait on you to get your stuff together. If you want this deal, then and you want me to do the assignment, then I need to get paid right now. If not, and I have to wait for a closing, that I'm going to double close and the price is going up. Now, which one do you want? You want it at this price with this assignment fee paid right now, or you want it over here at this price and you want to wait to not to pay anything until closing. Again, it's called the alternative choice. It's, it's called the alternative choice close. Assignment fee today, less expensive. I get paid. Everybody moves on. I'm going to go get you another deal. Okay, I got to wait. Well, now I got more expenses. I got, you know, holding time. I got, you know, um, you know, whatever. And I got to, you know, it's going to, it's going to have to cost more. That's just the way business works. You understand what I'm saying? So that's okay. it. Okay. It's not, and I know they don't teach you guys that stuff, but that's exactly what I would tell them. Okay. All right. Um, should I stay in my market or go virtual? Uh, both. I mean, both. I don't know what your market is. What is your market? I'm in Detroit. Okay, well, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity in Detroit right now because, you know, the prices have been so d- deflated. So you obviously want to be in um, an area, I don't know if you know what gentrification is, but y- yeah. you want to be in, in, in one of those areas up and coming where you're not the only guy that's rehabbing houses there, that there, there's valuations that are, it's either you either want to be there or you want to be in what the, what they call the opportunity zones. Do you know what that is? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you want to be if you're in Detroit, because I mean Detroit, Detroit has, has obviously has a bad rep based on what happened. Um, I would say that you would want to be in one of those two locations. Okay, either an area that's okay. that's going through regentrification or an opportunity zone, one one of the two. And the opportunity, yeah, opportunity uh, uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to say that makes sense because, like I told you, we um, me and a guy I'm partner over, we do already have. Uh, properties on a contract and everything like that. Like we're already doing things, but the problem mm-hmm. with Detroit is it's kind of hard because in certain areas, the ARV, like not even the current, you know, value, the ARV will only be like twenty five to thirty five thousand. And obviously, if it needs fifteen, twenty thousand in repairs, a lot of times yeah, it's hard to put deals together. Yeah, well, there is no deal because you're upside down. And that's why that's why that's what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, that may not be the best market to focus on because of that. But if you're going to be in that market. 
um, based on what I know, and I've never been to Detroit, so um, you know, I've just, I've just watched the um, valuations and the just absolute decimation of that market over the last decade. Uh, if you're going to be there, I, I would lean towards you know areas that are being regentrified and, and up and coming and that kind of thing, so that you've got a greater ability for more profit because it's a nicer area that people are going to want to move to, not, not the hood. Um, or for cat, long long term um, turnkey deals for cash flow buyers, um, one of the opportunities is so they get the tax benefits. That's what I would do in Detroit personally okay. if I if I was going to be there, if I was going to do deals there. But you don't have to do deals there; you can do deals anywhere. You don't have to be in a market. I mean, dude, I haven't been in a house that I've sold since um, 2008. Okay. So all over the United States, we do deals or whatever it is. And, and so then the next question is, well, how do I do that if I'm not there? Blah, blah, blah. Somebody's got to see the house. And what about the repairs? And it can all be handled by subcontractors. It's it's not any different than, I mean, there's, you don't physically have to be there. People can tell you, every, everybody's got a, um, you know, everybody's got a video camera on their phone, right? So you can see anything and everything. You can hire inspectors to go out. You can hire contractors to go out and give you estimates and, or not even hire them. Just have them go out and give you an estimate of, of whatever the repair, repair work needs to be, blah, blah, blah. So it doesn't have to be you physically being there to do all those things. Ideally, you know, I mean, the average person, their mentality is I want to go look at the house. Okay. Do you have any idea how many houses I've sold that I've never seen other than photographs? I mean, like every single house for 11 years. Right. Okay. Okay. So, oh, quick question for the uh, contractors. Can you work out a deal with them as well to where you, you know, exclusively use them in that market, of course, you know, but only pay them? Because a lot well, of people probably do the same thing. Yeah, I don't know. Are they, are they, when, you, when you contact a contractor to get an estimate, are they charging you a trip, trip charge? I'm sorry, like a trip charge or whatever they call it, like to come out? Yeah, are they charging you like, like, no. like 50, 50 bucks or something for them to show up or what? Yeah, I know a lot of them will charge, you know, to go look at it and give you estimates and all that. Well, look, man, you need to understand something. Um, could, could you work that deal out with one? Yeah, absolutely, you can. They're prob- probably the, the time to do that is not on the very first deal, if that makes any sense. What I would do is, you know, figure out who you like that you want to work with and then, you know, pay them their thing up front on, on the first one so they know you're legit. Okay, and then going forward, then you can see if you can work that same deal out. But even so, <clears throat> you got to what you need to understand, man. It's business. Okay, so what the average wholesaler guy does is he gets a ten thousand dollar assignment fee or whatever, and blows the money, right? And is not reinvesting back in the business. Okay, you shouldn't be worried about if you're selling a deal, right? And the deal is contingent upon cost of repairs to develop the ARV so that you figure out what your MAO is, right? You shouldn't be worried about 50 bucks, 75 bucks, a hundred bucks for a guy to go out there. If you've done your homework and you know that it's a deal sans some, you know, major, like this crap they show on HGTV all the time where all there's, you know, for, for, for the drama on the rehab show, there's always some big major thing that nobody could have possibly foreseen prior to their acquisition, right? Which is all, it's all done for TV crap. But right. n- nonetheless, you know, if, you know, the guy, the guy's got to go out there and spend time, okay? He's, and he's got to give you his professional opinion and all this stuff and he needs to get paid. So uh, you, you can't let those things be stopgap if you're, you know, if the concern is that you're short on funds and, and that's the thing, well, that's why you got to grind that out and get, get the first deal done and not blow all the money. And then let that be, become your launch pad for everything else going forward. So you're not worried about pay, paying 75 bucks to a mobile notary, 50 bucks to a mobile notary to go record the documents. Okay. Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, the, the title stuff or whatever it is initially when you get things up, up and running and going, they don't, they don't charge you a title up front anyway. I mean, maybe they, I don't know, maybe they do now. I've, I've never paid for title up front. Um, even when, you know, we were, we were being charged for it, they, they provide it and they provide you an invoice and then you pay it typically is the way it used to be. Maybe they've changed over the years. I don't, I, I very rarely ever have to clear titles. So it's not, um, the, the current methodology I would say would not be my area of expertise because I do everything I can to avoid title companies right. for lots of, for, for lots of reasons. Um, 
And you don't even, I mean, you need to understand something. You don't even, the, it's the abstractor is the one that's pulling all the information. You understand that, right? Mm -hmm. yep. It's an abstractor. It's not somebody that works for the title company. They don't have, you know, most of them, maybe some, some may, but it's, it's an individual contractor called an abstractor. This is the guy that goes down to the courthouse that pulls all the information. All the title company does then is they take his information and they put it on a title commitment. They like they copy and paste his crap, his app onto a title commitment based on whatever insurer they're going to be going through, and so you know, you, yeah, that's why the thing is like all these people, oh, I'm going to close a title company. It's like professional. It says all this. You don't even understand what they're doing. They're taking somebody else's information. They slap it on a piece of paper, okay, and then they provide they provide signatory services. Okay, well, you don't need an, an attorney to be present. You can have a, have a notary, okay, to for a lot less money, those cost 400 bucks for a notary, right? And mm -hmm. they provide, you know, the the go between between you and the abstractor, so they can provide you the title commitment for title insurance. They sell title insurance, and then they do um, two other two other functions, which is disbursement, which means they're going to disperse the funds to whoever the party is, whoever the buyer, the seller is that's getting the money, and or anybody else associated with the deal, realtors, whatever, you know. Um, whoever else was involved, and then recordation. They'll record the deed at the courthouse, okay? You don't need them for any of those things, okay? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So yep, it does. You, you can do all those things on your own, right? So like when you see like Jonathan Rexford and these guys, and they're doing these, uh, a sub-2 deal, which is a wraparound mortgage, they're not using, they're not using, they're not using most of them, but the, the intelligent guys, the guys that know what they're doing are not using attorneys to close those deals because it's not necessary. It's an unnecessary expense that yields nothing of value. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. your, your deal is not being insured. And what I mean by that is just because it, it's closes with an attorney doesn't make your deal legit. They're not reading your contracts. They're not re reviewing all that stuff. They're not going through it and saying, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, everything you've done here is completely legal. Other than they sign right here, sign right here, sign right here, sign right here. Okay, we, we we need a check or a wire for X number of dollars. That's it. That's all they do. Okay, I mean unless you're specifically paying them to do to do a contract review. Okay, and you need to understand something with that as well. The and people don't get this. The you know attorneys all they provide is what's called an opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, an opinion. That's it. It's not. It's not. Not you know um, insurance, like because you close with them. That right. You know everything's everything's okay. Right. Some of those. Some of those are probably an opinion, and I have to tell this to people all the time. You know, fifty percent of the people. Let me rephrase that. Fifty percent of the attorneys in the United States are proven wrong in every courtroom in America every single day. Despite having a six figure degree and going to law school and all the other stuff. Right. So what's, what's the, what's the value? Right. Okay. So am I, I'm not saying that an attorney doesn't, that no attorney doesn't have, doesn't have knowledge or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. You need to understand what I'm talking about. Well, well right. I okay. Do. Okay. So anyway, so there, there you have it. All right, questions answered. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that was really everything. Um, quick question: Is this, uh, is this call recorded? Like, is there any way I could listen back to this too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah, if you could actually shoot me over. Now, let me ask you. I want to ask you up front before, because um, I don't want to just like share with anybody. I do have a few people that I'm like joint venturing with and stuff. I'm not just gonna put it out there like publicly or nothing but like that. Uh, but would you mind if I let them listen to it too, like the people I'm partnering with? No, I don't care. Okay, cool. I just I just wanted to get your you know permission up front. I don't like this. Yeah. yeah, go behind people back and do stuff. That's fine. I can just put it. I can just put it up as I'll, I can just put it. Put it I'll, I'll bleep out the profanity and just put it up as as a podcast, and that way everybody can hear it. Okay, I mean that would be cool too. I'll, but I'll, can you send it to me with the profanity? <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Because, I mean, I, I, I like people to hear the real, like, the real conversation and the real truth. At least, <laughs> like, like I said, I won't put it, like I said, I won't put it out there publicly with the uh, profanity, but at least the people that I'm working with, right sure. now, they will want to hear that. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they'll, uh, they'll get a kick out of it. 
Okay, yeah, I, I gotta, I'll have to download it. Uh, as soon as we hang up, it'll be live on the server and I can download it. And then I, okay, I can't do it right now because I gotta, my, my daughter, I gotta take her in the pool. Um, but I, I can probably get it to you on Monday. Okay, yeah, I think this will be a fire podcast episode too. I think a lot of people get a lot of, uh, you know, info from it. Yeah, well, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, you, that it actually was, um, Kind of jam packed there, brother. We, we kind of we got a lot in it in a very short period of time. Right. Yeah. So yeah, all right. definitely, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even think about that though. This would make a really good podcast episode. So I definitely, you know, and I thank you for the information and everything too. Yeah. It's my pleasure. It's and see, here's the thing: if you have these questions, you got to know, you know, just about everybody else does too. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So it's good good stuff for everybody so they can understand how things sh- really should be done and how to do things as opposed to all this crap that they're being taught in these stupid courses and they can't figure out why they're struggling or why they have to lie to people or falsely advertise or, you know, put stuff in contracts so they can try to weasel out and all I mean, I hate that crap. It's just not necessary. So anyway, enough of that. I got to go get her in the pool. Good afternoon. If you got any other questions, just, just hit me up on Slack. I'll be happy to answer them for you. And then, um, like I said, we'll start releasing all of the other information so you can start absorbing that as well, um, not only on Virtual Real Estate Investor, but also for the Million Dollar Wholesaling Blueprint because, you know, I don't know, my personal opinion is that it's going to go gangbusters once the information starts getting out there and people say like, okay, yeah, there's never been anything like this before because there hasn't, because nobody's ever showed you guys how to do this stuff the right way through, through complete vertical integration, multiple streams of income, not having to lie to people, how to get paid at the time of the assignment, right? Uh, better marketing right. methods. There's a whole bunch of stuff I haven't even covered yet on, um, there's a whole other platform of um, income that I've been researching here over the okay. last few weeks that um, you know would be in- integrated as well. So Okay. You know, it's funny. I know you got to go right quick, but I just wanted to say this. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Everybody that I like talk to and work with in JV, um, I'm working with a small group right now. And mm-hmm. I let them know, uh, I pretty much posted your podcast and told everybody, like, start off with the sales episode. They listen to it. Everybody's like, man, that was a go. Like, I'm so glad you posted that. That's like, they just like, everybody's like, that was just some gold nuggets right there. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Oh, yeah. Like, I always recommend, you know, your podcast and everything. Like, when anybody's looking for free information, like, if they can't afford, obviously, the course or, you know, the partnership agreement and everything, then I, I like, listen to this podcast. <laughs> Like, that's where you start off. Forget all those other Google podcasts and all that. This is where you start off at. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you, really. I sincerely appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully people are getting some, some value from it as opposed to the all the nonsense that's being shilled out there, which is very frustrating. Oh, yeah. I, I tell people all the time. I don't, I'm not just saying this because we're on the phone. Like, I'm, I'm not the type of person that's going to build somebody up or nothing like that. Like, if I didn't like it, I'd yeah. be straight up, you know. Oh, yeah. I, trust me. I know you would. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I, I do tell people, like, list, like, literally, if you can't afford to do, like, a really good course, like, I always either recommend either, you know, you or, you know, honestly, not everybody has, like, the 500 to put down. So, I'm like, all right, well, if you can't do that, that's what I would like, recommend. But if mm-hmm. you can't do that, then I always recommend, you know, Jonathan. And if they don't yeah. want to pay anything, you know, the 20, 20K club, I'm like, anybody can pay $20. Come on. Yeah, I mean, like, come on. If you can't yeah. pay 20 you, sh- you shouldn't even be in business. Like, you know, well, I mean, you're, you're not they ser- don't want to do that. Yeah, you're not, you're not serious. I mean, good guy. Look, right. And that's the thing. People don't understand this. Like, it's like, okay, so 500 bucks or whatever it is. Dude, you, you, to, to, to form a corporation, if you go through like, you know, company.com or incorporate.com or whatever it is, depending on what state you're going through, to do that, to then pay the bull crap with the state, right, to for the, um, you know, all the junk you got to deal with with the, with the state to pay them, and then you got to pay a, a registered agent and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, you're already at or over 500 bucks unless you're personally forming the corporation on your own and just paying the filing fee. And so it kills me when people are like, oh, 500 bucks, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, really? I mean, okay, are you serious? You know, I mean, right. you know, go, go look at what it costs just to form a formal corporation. I'm here. I'm going to show you how to make six figures here this year. And you're complaining about 
five hundred bucks. I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, yeah. There's a reason. Look, man, you you heard me cover this over and over again. Ninety eight, ninety eight and a half percent of the population makes less than two hundred grand a year, which is friggin' ridiculous, especially in you know the, the what could be argued as the best economy the U.S. has ever seen with the advent of the internet and the 24 seven global cash register known as the internet. Okay. There's really no reason for people, for, for people to struggle. That's why I did that post yesterday, man, on, um, the old test group deal. Dude. Like there's no reason for people to struggle. They struggle by, by, by choice because of making bad decisions. You know, I don't know if you saw the post that I did, but it's like, we do, we do the virtual arbitrage with the wholesaling the medical commodities all over the United States. We're in about 33 markets right now. And I've sold hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth, worth of them, but only ever, um, prior, prior to yesterday, I had only ever done, actually picked up product myself twice. Um, once was so I could train couriers on how to do it, because it's kind of hard to teach somebody something you've never done. That was back in 20, late, late 2014. And then another time was in 2015, the guy was calling off of our Houston ad, um, but he happened to be about 15 minutes away from where I, I was at, where my um, my in-laws lived in, um, if you know where Bryan College Station is, which is where Texas A&M University is at. Um, I was heading out, to, heading out to the Kroger, to to the grocery store or whatever, and he was about 15 minutes away from there, and it was like 30 boxes, and I'm like, okay, I, I, you know, I, I made 700 bucks before I stepped foot out the door because I'd already sold the product. And then I went and picked it up and some guy calls yesterday and um, he's about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, well, probably 20 minutes from the house. Um, when I was, I had to go to the grocery store once again, anyway. Um, and, you know, it was like 20 minutes and I don't normally personally ever go do the pickups or anything. It was like two, less than two minutes on the phone, negotiate the deal, give me the address. Fantastic. I'll, you know, I'll be there in about half an hour and, you know, $500 net profit. Like that in 20 minutes. Okay. Like, so it's like, it's not off of free Craigslist ad. It may have, and it may have been a $3 Craigslist. I'm not sure which Craigslist ad he called off of, but it was either free or three bucks. Okay. For, and I made 500 bucks like that. Okay. Friday afternoon. Wow. Yeah. And that was just one deal we did that day. I mean, the rest of them were all done virtually all over the United States, but that's one I personally saw. So now in four years, five was it four years, five years, whatever. Uh, I've only picked up product three times, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars made off of that. And anybody can do it, but they just, you know, they, they're, they make stupid decisions and they, and they yeah, can't figure out. Say, honestly, can. I'm sorry. I was going to say, honestly, the only thing that's been holding me back is that too. I wasn't sure if um, I had to go. Cause right now I'm not able to really go like, you know, on every call and pick up products and things like that. So that's been kind of mm-hmm. holding me back from it. We're going to be a, you think, you we know, got VA, yeah, yeah, the VA's listen. The, the way I've got the, you have all the questions. The way it's all set up in, in Podio, dude, I had, I hired this back in 2015. I hired the very first VA I hired for handling phone calls was a $2, $2 an hour VA in the Philippines. Okay. And I said, I just told her training was like, look, here, here's Podio. Here's, here's the people are going to call in. And all you're going to do is you're going to ask these questions and then you're going to, the, the script pops up automatically as to exactly what to say based on the pricing because the pricing, Auto, it, it, it pulls up automatically once she enters in the information. I say, just say this and then shut up. Okay. And then they're going to tell you the date or not the date, but the, the time and location to do the pickup. And then you pop this information in, send it, and it automatically goes to the courier. And her very first deal, she netted me 450 bucks. I didn't know anything I did. I wasn't even involved. I didn't talk to anybody. All I did was send a PayPal. I sent a PayPal, which took me to- like 20 seconds. Right. And you don't have to go pick it up personally either? No, the courier does that. Oh, cool. See, that's that's what's been holding me back from doing it. Is Like I said, I, I have time to make the, like take the calls. I just haven't had time to like actually go pick up the product. So if I can have a courier go pick it up, then that's, yeah, I'll definitely get on that then. Well, yeah, the, the ads, the courier and sign placer ads are in the members area for virtual arbitrage. Exactly what I use. Exactly how I do it. I don't talk to them either. They got to go through a whole application process. Um, before they get hired, I don't talk to anybody in advance. Once we have all their information, because otherwise you're just going to get you get flooded with calls and stupid questions that are answered on the website so that they, they don't want to be bothered. And I, I do it as a test to make sure they can follow instructions because they're handling our cash, obviously. And be it based on on the product, you got to know what you're doing to make sure you're not buying the wrong product or whatever. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, we have, we have careers all over the United States, dude. I mean, that's, you, you can't scale by being a solopreneur. Okay. Right. You, you got to be able to outsource all that stuff. So let's take a look at, at what happens. What happens is this. Now, yesterday, as an example, which is an oddity because I don't ever pick up product. I am picked up personally picked up product, like I said, in last time was four years ago. But because it was like, you know, $500 net profit and the guy's like 20 minutes. So I was like, okay, what the hell? I don't want to do it, but I'm going to go, I'll, I'll do it anyway. Just, you know, I don't even know why I did it. If you want to know the truth, I was just I was like <laughs> actually contemplating not doing it. But, um, but anyway, nonetheless, so I went, I went and did that or whatever. And it's, there's a, there's a cost. So when you're outsourcing with VAs, okay, or, or in couriers and, and sign placers, because they, they do all the stuff, there's an additional cost. So I technically, theoretically, make less money because I have the expense of a VA that handles all of our shipping and packing, you know, all of our shipping labels and and um, the uh, the invoicing. She handles all the invoicing stuff. She handles all the back end stuff to make sure everything's running, you know, all the tracking numbers from the shipping labels. We, we track everything end to end, right? Uh, so, but that, and that costs money. And so, so technically I make less money. And then I got a courier that I'm paying, you know, 15 bucks an hour plus 19 cents a mile to go pick up product. And that costs money. So I'm making less money theore theoretically, right. right? And then I got a sign place that goes out there and they get paid a dollar per sign place. And of course they can make, you know, um, depending on how if, if they hustle or not, they can, the highest paid guy was at $53 an hour because the guy, he was a Hispanic guy and the guy just was out there and he was like, you know, all businessman. And we could knock them out, you know, 50 some of them. And I'm like, look, I'll pay 500 bucks a day. I don't care if you get signs out. Um, you get as many out as you can. That's fine with me. But he was at $53 an hour getting the signs out. Averages somewhere between 20 and 30 bucks an hour based on how people do it. They're all, they're all kind of, you know, they're all very close where they go so they can make money very quickly. But that cost me money also, right? And I got the, I got the bandit signs I got to pay for at roughly 2400 bucks per thousand. So that costs money. But what it does, though, is even though I'm making, you know, it's like chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, it, I can scale. And while I may make less per deal, theoretically, than if I did it myself, it frees up my time to then be able to scale to market after market after market after market after market. Okay, so I'm okay making a little bit less per deal, because I don't want to put out bandit signs. Okay, I don't, I, like I said, I didn't even want to go pick up the product yesterday to make 500 bucks. Okay, like, I'm like, see, you know, don't take this the wrong way. But, you know, I'm, I'm seriously like sitting there contemplating, like, do I really want to go do this? You know, it's, it, yeah, it's 500 bucks, but I mean, like, do I really want to like waste the time to, you know, 20 minutes to go pick this stuff up? And I'm like having this internal struggle with myself because that's just not how my business is set up. And I'm like, finally, I'm like, that with it. I got to go to the grocery store anyway. I might as well just go ahead and do it. Um, right. But, the, you know, that, that would have been a game changer for, for the average person. You yeah, see what I'm saying? You know, 500 bucks on, you know, in, in 20 minutes on Friday afternoon whatever, they would have a great weekend or keep the lights on or pay, you know, have money towards the car payment or whatever. That's like a big, big thing for a lot of people. And, but they won't do it because they make bad decisions, you know, and that's the unfortunate aspect mm -hmm. is that they, people make a lot of really very bad decisions where it's like Jonathan Rexford and I were having this, this um, conversation the other day um, about, uh, he actually did a Facebook live on it later on about, just a different side because we're, we talk and we're, we both are into multiple streams of income, multiple streams of internet income, always looking for, you know, oddity, let me rephrase it, oddity side hustle stuff that is not mainstream. Okay. That most people don't know about. So there's obviously less competition at it to keep things moving forward because we know, unfortunately dude, and I don't mean it would be the very bad news or negative or whatever, but you know, there's a massive recession that's coming. Okay. And yeah, I, you, I was just going to say that you need um, to understand. I'm sorry, you, I cut you off. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not cut you off. I was just going to say right quick that uh, I was listening to, you know, Ryan Stillman, the Hot Dog Closer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was saying that uh, on one of his podcasts, he was like, I got bad news. He was like, man, we're in like one of the best, like you said earlier, with the internet and all these different ways to make money and how fast it could be. He was like, if you aren't making money in this uh, economy, then I got bad news for you when the recession hits. Well, yeah, he would, be, he would be right about that for sure. I would agree it, because it's coming. And the one thing I'm going to tell you, and you better pay attention, is this: the wholesaling course that I'm putting out, I'm putting it out because the market is wanting it and, excuse me, demanding it. 
and they're willing to pay for it. Okay. Um, but here's what I know and what, what will be part of that course is to let everybody know up front and in advance that you got to make hay while the sun is shining and the sun is shining like right now because wholesaling model is, is dying. Okay. It is on life support right now. Okay. So understand that. Okay. That's why, listen to what I'm saying though. That's why you need these other skills that we're talking about with when this thing shifts, what's going to happen is the, the wholesalers and the rehabbers are going to be out of business overnight. Okay. And so that's why it's imperative right now to understand that you need all of these tools and these weapons in your arsenal to overcome that. And Oh, by the way, you need to get your ass into something other than real estate. Also, that's why I do the medical medical commodities thing because the, the market shifts, that's not going away. Okay. So real estate market takes a downturn. Guess what? Diabetics don't stop being diabetic. They don't stop having test strips. You understand what I'm right. saying? Okay. So I'm, I'm trying, so I'm bound, trying to balance out between the two of them. And I got another um, two things, two other side hustle, you know, six figure side hustles that I'm working on right now too, that also um, are designed to help be recession proof. Okay. That's me personally. Now, and let me, let me put this in perspective. Let me put this in perspective for you. Okay, I live in a $1.3 million house in a guard-gated, master-planned resort community that's got a five-star hotel, has a water park. I live on a Jack Nicholas golf course. Okay, It's absolutely fantastic and gorgeous here. I am literally six minutes from the back gate of Disney. All right? Everything's fantastic. Wow. And, and if I, with what I make and what I'm doing, am working on my own recession proof, hopefully knock on wood, you know, recession proof, recession resistant income streams that are not related to real estate. What do you think you and everybody else should be doing? Because I see what's coming. I, I know what's coming. Okay. And the reason, if you want to know the truth, the, the reason that, which I, like I said, I would not normally have done that I wouldn't pick up that, that product, you know, to make 500 bucks yesterday is because I know what's coming. Okay. I know what's coming. It's, it's, you understand? I know what's coming and it's like, you got to make it now. You got to get positioned properly now because when it hits, it's too late. You're going to get decimated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You I mean, you, you, being, yeah. I'm sorry. I was going to say, that's the reason I've also been being honest with myself. Like, now, yeah, I've made money in a couple of different spaces and things like that, but you know, it's, I still, you know, I tell people straight up, you know what I mean? Even though I put out content out there and try to teach people stuff, I never try to teach what I don't know. I just teach what I do know to try to help people and things like that. And I have made some money, but being honest with myself and others, I definitely haven't done everything I could and hustled as hard as I could. Well, buddy, where I want to be and where I should be. You, you got to look, you got to, you got to turn off the TV. You got to get off the Facebook, the Twitter, the whatever the hell you're doing. You, you got to focus right now, man, because I'm, it's, it's coming. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not Mr. Negative. Okay? I'm not Mr. Little chicken, chicken little sky is falling. Get on Bloomberg, get on MSNBC, get on CNBC, get on any friggin', you know, um, um, investing website and you will see interview after interview after article after article of what's I did a podcast. I did a, a, a webinar on this, like, I don't know, five, six months ago on all the different factors with the inverted yield curve, right? Okay, you know what they probably you may not even know what that is. And you all the different things that are happening right now, okay? It's all it's it's all lining up for two thousand eight all over again, but only worse this time. Right. Okay. It's all there. All the metrics are there. Okay. So you got, you know, I know you probably don't even know, but the Fed uh was it last week or ten days ago had to throw another seventy five billion into what's called the repo market. And um that's not good. Okay. That's not good. It's like they're, they're, they're trying to, um, it's like, a, it's like a shot of adrenaline to somebody that, whose heart is stopped. They're trying to keep the heart going through the infusion of more funny money into the system. Okay. Right. All, I mean, like all of the metrics are there. So that's what I'm trying to tell you is, is look, you're young. And how do you, you're like in your twenties, right? Yeah, 27. 27, okay. And you, you have a child, if I recall correctly, right? 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. You got to focus, man. Okay. You, you got to start, start tracking your time and see where you're wasting it. And you got to focus on all these things that we're talking about and get yourself set up in, in positions so that you've got multiple streams of income coming in. Because when that crash comes down, it's too late. Okay. The time is right now. It's like, you know, Noah didn't wait till the flood started, right? Until, the, until it started raining to build, build the ark. You got to start building the ark now. Does that make sense? Or definitely. Okay. All right. So focus. Don't spread yourself too thin with all these different things. Focus stands for follow one course until success. You need to focus on that. The easiest, fastest money for you right now is test strips if you handle it properly. And that will be consistent, and that will be recession-proof as long as there is a currency and some type of an economy. Because, like I said, diabetics don't stop being diabetic. The test strips don't stop being produced or needed. So regardless of what happens in real estate, that's still going to be there. That's what that's what helped Johnson survive 2008. Okay, I went under completely in a $4.5 million bankruptcy. He didn't because he had the test strip side hustle, right? So... You know, don't don't get off on too many tangents. You got to follow one, get one up and running and making money, and then move on to the next one. And the the number one that I would advise for you is test strips right out of the gate because you can make cash today, just like I did yesterday, right? Off of free Craigslist, you make cash today. You can make cash every single day, same way that I do, and get that up and running. And then you know, then you have these repeat sellers that just it's like passive income, dude, because they just like we have the system set up and they just they get emailed and they text get, um, get emails and text messages when they're supposed to get product. They get they get follow up from us every single month, and it's just like clockwork: bam, 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 money. Here comes money. Here comes money. And you got to set things up the right way, okay? And what that then does is that allows you to then focus on your real estate deals so that you can survive in between closings because you still have cash coming in. And that's what most people that buy, buy these courses don't have, right? Like people come in, they'll spend 500 bucks on something or a thousand bucks or 10 grand. And like, it's going to be the savior for them. But what they don't understand is pipeline management and the fact that you need cash to survive in between closings. Cause sometimes closings, they are delayed. Sometimes they fall out, whatever. And you got to still have consistent income coming in to be able to make it through. Does that make sense? Definitely. Yeah. All right. All right. There you go. I got to get my daughter in the pool. So hopefully that was beneficial. Definitely. Yeah, man. This is going to help a lot of people. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying that. Have a great weekend, man. Thanks. You too. Okay. I'll, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you for listening to the Virtual Real Estate Investor Podcast with Vincent Polisi. If you found any value in this podcast, please use our Give to Get method and take a moment to give us a five-star rating in iTunes and your favorite podcast service so we can keep giving you excellent episodes of real content you can use to profit today.